Hello and welcome to this, the Books Crypto Club weekly catch up on Zoom. It is Sunday the 4th of September 2022 and as is always with these sessions we're going to be talking about whatever crops up in the crypto, DeFi, NFT, ICO, STO, TGE or whatever acronyms you want to use in, in this space. We talk about whatever participants in the meeting want to talk about. So sometimes it can be quite basic uh, for novices who are just beginning to understand some of the terminology in the space. And also it's an opportunity for people who are more experienced to share their knowledge, their wisdom, their experiences, and if they're working on any particular projects, um, any details about those as well. So if you'd like to come along to a future session, then uh, there's a link to the meetings in the comments below. Do feel free to join in. As I say, it's open to everybody. We hold these meetings every Sunday evening, 7 p.m. UK time. Run for an hour and we just see what comes up, really. So with that, let's see who's going to come and join us today. Hi, Gary. How are you? <clears throat> I'm good, thank you. How are you today? Yeah, uh, doing good. Uh, just, uh, I guess, uh, seeing what new to learning crypto today so yeah <laughs> see what see what's going on in the in the world of crypto yeah no but there's always something that gets mentioned that you've not really looked into and then you end up going down a rabbit hole so yeah yeah because i think uh, you mentioned about interoperability last uh, week and then yeah i started doing a bit more research just to okay so i guess, I guess have you been looking at like sort of polka dots and uh Polkadot, yeah. Yeah. So just having a look at that and uh, just uh, understanding the kind of value it will eventually have once we have more of these, because obviously there's a lot of blockchains, but yeah. but then being able to just yeah connect between one another. Yeah. It, it, it comes back to the, the analogy I've used for many years is it's a little bit like how people remember the, the video wars of the uh, medium between VHS, Betamax, and Philips 2000. Yeah. Uh, I, and you may remember how there's the a battle as to, you know, is it going to be Philips 2000? Is it going to be Betamax? I, I always argue that the only um, thing that really won through all of that was actually the SCART socket on the back of the TV sets. Which, yeah. Which, which meant it didn't matter what you plugged into it. You know, and yeah. that, 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 that's a great example to me of interoperability that you could plug anything into it and it, and it all works so that, that's the way i think blockchains are necessarily going to have to be because you, you're beginning to see more and more of people talking about um atomic swaps across blockchains and interoperability in that way and you, you need yeah. a means of getting them to talk to each other yeah yeah because Obviously, there's multiple blockchains across there that obviously have their own utility and their own purpose, but then you, you bring even more utility that you can connect the two different blockchains to, to do what one another can do, so or, or be able to get data, but yeah. Absolutely. Well, you, you look at the kind of the, the, the evolving standards at the moment, <clears throat> and, and broadly speaking, it seems that the, the banks are kind of, XLM, XRP uh, oriented for payments. Um, some of the banking systems are aligning with the Corda standard, uh, Corda platform from R3. And some of the supply chain projects I've seen have been Hyperledger based. So yeah. you're going to necessarily need the ability one day to link your supply chain systems for things like product traceability, bill of materials, all this kind of stuff with your bank interoperability layer, which is likely to be like Corda or from R3, with a payments layer, which is likely to be something like XLM or XRP or even JP Morgan coin or whatever. So you, yeah. you, straight away, you've got three different prime blockchain platforms there. Um, which you're going to need to talk to each other. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, otherwise we completely defeat the object of having blockchain, which is a whole thing about uh, transparency and ease of use. Yeah. I, I guess the only concern is, so I guess 
to connect the different blockchains, you have to use a method, what is it called, bridging? Yeah. And I guess there seems to be quite a lot of vulnerabilities in using that method. So there's been a lot of hacks and I guess it could be it's just sloppy cord that's been happening and, and, and that's what's uh, allowing yeah. people to get into it. Well, I, th I think it's often the problem that when you're looking at vulnerabilities of systems, typically the, the system designers think about their system and, and they think about within it. So that it, it tends to be, it, it used to be the, the layers defense like a castle where you, you, you've got a moat, you've got a wall, you've got various things. So it, it's like layered protection to protect what's in, within your castle. And no one thinks about the fact that, okay, so you've protected your castle and party B's protected their castle. But in between the two of them, you've got this um, carriageway or whatever, which neither party is fully thinking about how to protect them. And so interoperability layer is always um, a threat vector um, yeah. that, that people go for because they tend to get looked at with less of a close eye because everyone always thinks the other side's done their bit and, and no one quite thinks about it. So, yeah, I, I agree. It, it, it's always the touch points. This is where um, I say about blockchains, again, it, it's quite often the on-ramps and the off-ramps that are where the vulnerabilities lie. So it's where data is going onto a blockchain it is, is a problem. Where data is coming out of a blockchain is a problem. Once it's on the blockchain, you know, the, the whole um, immutability and tr trustworthiness tends to be pretty good. But yeah. it's, it's, the bit of, it's the bit of getting it on and getting it off is the, um, the, the risky areas. So I think you're right on that. Yeah. Do you think going forward, we're going to implement procedures and I, I guess uh, standard coding methods that prevent this from happening? So th this is where, when you, when you take a look at things like international standards, so you've got the International Standards Organization, um, ISO, who, you know, th th they do things like international standards on electricity plugs and all sorts of stuff. Um, they, they've got Technical Committee 307, that's looking at all sorts of standards, and part of that will be around interoperability. Because the, the, the starting point about vulnerabilities is that, Sometimes a vulnerability is a bug that a hacker is exploiting, but sometimes it might just be a basic misunderstanding. You know, yeah. So, so I've, I've seen it many times where people have you know, written a specification for a bit of software and they've misunderstood what something's meant for or how it works. And this is where yeah. standards comes into play because standards mean at least we can all agree that, you know, the brown wire is earth, the red wire is live, or what, whatever they are type thing. Um, yeah. For, for, for when you're transferring data. So, yeah, I, I hope that that will reduce um, the, the risk of things failing. And if, if you've got standards around that, first of all, that's a good start. And then when you have minimum standards of how you pass packets of data, perhaps, or how you validate or verify things, Again, if you can have that as a standard, then I, th I think that'll improve things again. So I, I think standards and regulation are going to play a key part in the adoption level of blockchains and so crypto as well. Yeah. So you well, think... Sorry. No, no, go for it. I'm always interested in listening to what other people have got to think about this. Yeah, yeah no, no, it definitely sounds very interesting. So do you think interoperability will reach a bit more maturity next year that's when you said you think it's going to be the new kind of buzzword at such as DeFi had i think 2018 2019 I, 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 yeah you're right I, I believe so so i think DeFi was probably um 2019 stroke 2020 nfts yeah. was 2020 2021 i think yeah. um interoperability is going to really grow as we start seeing more and more platforms maturing and going live and becoming productionized and needing yeah. needing to in, interact with each other. Yeah. Okay. No, that's but, definitely but, you know, the, 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 That's just a view. It might turn out to be completely wrong. Yeah. I, I guess sometimes you, based on the information you take in, you just want to try and make predictions and just see how it plays out. Sometimes yeah. you get them wrong. Sometimes you get them right. So, 
Yeah, I, I, I should yeah. check back actually. I, I did a, um, a blog article in, I think it was 2019 or 2020, predicting what was going to happen in the next couple of years. Um, yeah. I, I must go and reread what I wrote to, to see <laughs> what, to see if any yeah. of it has come true. It was, the only thing you can normally be certain about the future is that we're going to get it wrong. Yeah. yeah that, that, that's just the nature of it. And um, we usually get it wrong. And I'm, I'm trying to remember who came out with saying that with technology, we always um, underestimate how long it's going to take to arrive. And then we, yeah. underest we underestimate the impact of it. Um, yeah. and, and so I, I think ultimately this is what's going to happen with blockchain. That I'm, I'm seeing more and more people moaning now saying, oh, blockchain, you know, we've been sold the hype. There's no production things. It's not happening. Blah, 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 blah. I, yeah. I think it's just gradually creeping in. So I, I, I do some work with a number of uh, tech companies. And one of them is live with its blockchain platform in the insurance industry. And no, yeah. one, knows, no one knows it's using blockchain. And, and they don't need to. And yeah. I, I, th I think that's going to gradually creep in and creep in. So we're going to start seeing or possibly not see uh, more and more platforms will be blockchain based without us even realizing it or noticing it, which is the way it should be. Yeah. I, I, we, uh, what, what is that tech company using blockchain for? So they're using it for insurance. So things like policy administration. Um, and so they're live in, I think it's Indonesia. They've launched a product with uh, students who are paying um, for rental accommodation and insurance on the property, if I remember correctly. And they're also doing it with, um, I think it's a French insurance company as well. And again, okay. it's, a, it's around policy administration. The, the thing um, people kind of forget that they always get very blinkered about blockchain. And what, yeah. its and what its benefits are. And so, you know, I, I, I describe block blockchain, broadly speaking, there's five major use case areas into where block blockchain gets used. Yeah. One of them is as cryptocurrency. You know, we've got that with Bitcoin, JP Morgan coin, all this kind of thing. Um, another one is as a, uh, a distributed ledger. So a ledger of truth. So you look at things like Everledger, where they track uh, diamonds, that, that kind of thing. So as, as provenance, that's, that's the second one. Um, a third one is through smart contracts. So programmability, trusted programmability. And that's what the, this uh, company is doing, that they've encoded all of the rules around commissions and fees into a series of smart contracts. So it means all parties can agree on what fees are and see what they are, uh, and they automatically execute on that. Um, the, the other areas I think against which we can have blockchains is as um, tokenization, which is a, a really big area. You know, we're seeing that with NFTs and that kind yeah. of thing. Um, and I can't even remember what the fifth one is now. I've, I've actually done a YouTube video where I list off the, the five, which is cryptocurrency, ledger of trust, tokenization, smart contracts, and something else. I'm going to have to find out what something else is now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, and, and so in this case, within the, um, with this insurance proposition, it's around codifying the smart contracts and using smart contracts uh, to execute the business logic and make it consistent. Yeah. Okay, no, that's very interesting to see because I think I always read about the theory of this being applied to insurance policies, etc. But it's, it's good to actually hear that it actually is occurring now. Well, if you ever want to chat about insurance and blockchain, I, I, I always say if you, if you draw a circle that says insurance, draw a circle that says blockchain, and where they overlap, it says yeah. Gary, it says Gary Nuttall because that, that, that's absolutely my sweet spot. So I've actually run a number of projects in the insurance sector around using blockchain technology okay. um, for, for things like claims management, claims handling uh, as an experiment. Uh, one was around 
Um, we're beginning to look at policy administration and payments. But there's another live project, which is that there's a German stroke Austrian company called EtherRisk. Okay. Um, and the EtherRisk, well worth checking out. Um, they have got a number of um, insurance type capabilities. Uh, one is a flight delay product that is live. And so you tell them through their platform, you know, you're booked to go on flight British Airways 125 on Tuesday the 7th of September at 940 or whatever from um, Heathrow to Amsterdam. Um, you pay a fee in Ether and then they've got a kind of a sentinel which checks a flight time oracle and it checks automatically to see if your flight operated on time and if it was delayed you automatically get well, uh, you automatically get compensation so you think about um how normal flight delay insurance works is you yeah. buy, is you buy a policy you stick it in the drawer you completely forget about it uh, your flight's delayed by six hours and you never get around to claiming because you just know it's going to be a load of aggro and it takes ages and that. If you, do yeah. if you do claim, it'll typically take 14 days. Well, with ether risk, the idea is that you don't make a claim because you don't need to. Yeah. Because the, because the smart contract automatically um, checks to make sure your flight went on time. And if it didn't, you get, you get um, a payment. So that they've done that. They've also done a project in Sri Lanka, which is around crop protection insurance. So they've, yeah. got, they've got sensors in. There's a lot of small holding farms in Sri Lanka, um, and they've put sensors around the fields. And if it rains more than a certain amount, then the assumption is that the crop is damaged and a claim is automatically paid. And, that, and that's done through... Uh, one of the world's largest insurance brokers, Aon. Uh, oh, okay. so, so, so it's got credibility. Um, and so that, that that's quite an interesting one. So I, I was involved in working with Etherisk when they were going through the FCA sandbox a few years ago. Great company. Yeah. Well, well, well recommend um, checking into them. And, and then there's a, a bunch of other insurance projects as well that have been doing stuff. There's, um, there's one which has actually uh, recently failed which was the, there was a consortium called B3I who were a number of, it was initially five uh, very large reinsurance companies. So I think it was Munich Re, Swiss Re, Allianz, uh, uh, can't recall the others, but th they built up a, a platform um, that was going to do reinsurance contracts. Unfortunately, that, that recently failed. They ran out of money. And so they're winding that down at the moment. But that, that was going to be an interesting one, um, which is a shame because that, that, that would have made real headway in the insurance industry by it being big insurance companies doing that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But there's, there's a bunch of other insurance projects that are live um, that use blockchain under the hoods now and you don't, you don't even realize it. Yeah. No, no, it's very interesting to hear just yeah. that they are actually being used. And I guess, as with all kind of things blockchain related, it is still in its uh, early days. So I guess yep. you have all these other companies that are just testing uh, blockchain within their processes. And I'm sure over time it will start to mature and more companies will actually use it. So, so that's the thing. I, I do a lot of um, training courses with companies around blockchain and how to adopt it and all this kind of stuff. And it ultimately comes down to identifying what the benefits of using blockchain are. So it, it may be about the fact you've got an immutable record. It may be about traceability. Uh, it may be about transparency. So for a company, they have to, first of all, figure out, actually, blockchain's got all these benefits, but are they of any benefit to my organization? Because yeah. they, might, they might not be. Uh, and then they have to take a look at what the business processes are that they're looking at blockchainizing and look at what they would need to do to take advantage of the features of blockchain. What, what would they need to change to their business processes? And that's where a lot of the time they fall over. 
So if you say, you know, oh, well, the benefit of blockchain is that everyone involved in the transactions got complete tra uh, transparency. They can see everything all at the same time. They don't have to wait for batch process anymore. It sounds great until you speak to an insurance broker and they say, oh, yeah, but we only check claims on a Friday. You know, okay. but, but, you know, you're going to have the claim information right away. Oh, no, no, the way, the way our team's structured is we do this on a Tuesday, this on a Wednesday, this on a Friday. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, well, it's not worth doing then, is it? So so this this is what I, I spend a lot of time with companies, um, helping them to figure out. Some, sometimes it's the, it's the culture of their organization that might be the limiting factor. Um, it's very rarely a technology problem that, that prevents blockchain from being adopted. It's more about, is there a benefit which is sufficient yeah. for that business to realize. And is the business and the other parties involved in the transactions, are, the, are they all willing to change to take advantage of it? Because if they're not, it's not worth doing. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, I, I, I could um, literally go, go on for hours about blockchain and insurance. So you're looking at um, any other things apart from interoperability at the moment? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. I remember, I think it was maybe two or three weeks ago, we were having a conversation about Tornado Cash. Yep. And I can't remember who was on the call as well. But I think one of his questions was, how can the media say that Tornado Cash is being used for illicit activities? Mm-hmm. We were discussing that and we were just, yeah, we were unsure because obviously if it's a mixer, you have no idea. It's obviously providing a, a kind of like shield or privacy for those transactions. Yep. But I ended up going down a rabbit hole for that. And I guess one thing that is involved with Tornado Cash, you obviously can see the addresses that are starting, uh, that mm -hmm. are start process, and then you can obviously see the the addresses are, are at the end as well. So ultimately, you know, there, there's probably going to be some wallets which are associated with Ill illicit activities. And then you can obviously see like this one's used Tornado Cash. So obviously on that basis, you can tell that there is illicit activity occurring. And I think also there's another situation where this happened. So I think there was a hack within KuCoin. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember when it happened. But I think it was approximately 10,000 equivalent of Ether was hacked from the exchange. And what they did was, I think they used a liquid pool to turn the Qcoin into Ethereum. Okay. They then uh, transferred it to multiple wallets. And then they uh, uh, used Tornado Cash to then obviously mix it up and then, you know, obviously hide where it's ended up going. But I think one thing one way they were able to recover a lot of that money was they were seeing that all of a sudden there's like a hundred Bitcoins just being transferred into Tornado Cash. And then you're seeing the output, there's all these accounts where all of a sudden there's a hundred Ether coming out. So obviously you can't say a hundred percent, but you can probably say with high probability that yep. that hundred uh, Ether that's come from the hack and has come to the other side is linked to that. So that's how we were able to obviously follow the tracks. And I think that's very much it. So if you take a look at, there's two companies who are really good in this space. Uh, there's yeah. Elliptic, who do a lot of uh, tracking and tracing, and there's yeah. chain, chain analysis. And, and both the com those companies are real leaders in this space. And yeah. a absolutely, as you say, you've got no... 100% certainty, but what they do is they develop what they probably describe as heuristics. So it's like behaviorally, what, what does this look like? Yeah. And so the, there are certain natures of transactions where they, they can fairly confidently say, this looks dubious in some way. Um, and so they, they can flag it in that way. They do maintain lists of known um, criminal um wallet addresses so they can certainly use those in some way i believe but you're right there's generally no absolute certainty but it, yeah if, if you notice 100 ETH come in go and get mixed and then magically 100 ETH come out yeah it's a fairly safe bet that they're connected in some way 
Yeah. yeah. So we've just been joined by Richard. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> he was on for a moment. <laughs> he, he, he came on, he had his camera and he went. Yeah, so it's always worthwhile. Elliptic and Chain Analysis both write some really good reports as well on yeah. the work that they do. Uh, and they, they offer some clues as to uh, what level they look at and what they're looking for and that. But they don't give everything away, obviously. Um, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, it's 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 fascinating how how they do that, and it, it comes down to the old, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and swims like a duck, yeah, it's probably a duck. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it is the, the other thing as well, and this is where it gets fascinating as well. That crypto, through its nature of having the blockchain behind it, means that you can quite often track and trace things down to a, an originating wallet level which means yeah. that which means that you, you can trace back any crypto you've got through its journey of life and see if it's been associated in some way with um, an illegal wallet or one that's been flagged yeah now, now you can't do that with cash you know if if a million pounds is stolen from the local barclays bank or whatever and that million pounds is never recovered. Um, and the criminals give the money to their friends and they fence it, they do whatever. Then the very fact, even, even if they did have all the serial numbers, we, we don't trace it to that level. And, yeah. yet, we, and yet we could, you know, if they put enough admin in. And it's bizarre that you get this kind of tainting of crypto but all because you can prove it has been associated with something illegal in the past, it's now tainted forever. Yeah. So, so it's, it's almost like, you know, if, if a million pounds gets stolen and it, if it gets sprayed in the pink spray or whatever it is, then fair enough, you can see it's a bit, you know, of dubious origin. But with crypto, it all gets sprayed all the time. So but we, we, um, we don't treat traditional fiat money like that. You know, we, yeah. we, we, don't, we don't think of a five or a ten pound note as potentially having history against which we'll refuse to accept it. You know, oh, this was used in a bank job 15 years ago type thing. Whereas, yeah. we, do with, whereas we do with crypto, which is strange. Yeah. And I guess that's one thing. So people, when they think about cryptocurrencies, they think, oh, it's secure. We're never going to be able to track me. Uh, things on the lines of that. But Ultimately, if they know that this is your address, they can, as you said, look at every single thing that you've done back to whenever you set up that address. So, and it's yeah. some it's something that I've, I've long held the view that uh, law enforcement agencies and some government departments have always maintained: oh, crypto is bad. Crypto is used by drug dealers, criminals. It's dreadful. It's completely anonymous. It's awful. Blah 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 blah. In actual fact, they love it because of the yeah. very fact it it leaves a complete audit trail of what, where it's come from, where it's gone to, and that was actually used. Um, there was a court case, I think, in Denmark. Uh, Springs to mind of Denmark, Sweden, about three years ago, and it was two drug dealers who were prosecuted um, for drug dealing. And the evidence that was used against them uh, was the transactions that they'd done on the Bitcoin blockchain network. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, um, I, I often think that whenever law enforcement agencies say, oh, crypto is really bad because it's completely untraceable, we hate it. it, it yeah. It's almost, it's almost like they're trying to encourage the criminals to use it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. So I guess that if anyone was you know, doing tax fiddling and stuff like that, HMRC eventually wants to develop their ability to look for all of this. They'll, they'll be able to see who's been dodging on their taxes quite easily. So, yeah. and that's why, if you look at the rules with um, certainly with the UK tax and HMRC, from what I recall, the obligation these days is for you to maintain complete records of all your transactions. Yeah. So, so it's it's not even. I'm not sure it's even at the level of you've got an obligation to pay the relevant taxes, but certainly it's a that you have to keep the records. And yeah. 
they, they have certainly got the ability now to go to all of the major exchanges and say, you know, give us details of all the transactions. This has happened in the US already. Um, the US tax authority um, actually um, served notice on, I think it was Coinbase, and they asked for every record of every transaction that Coinbase had done. And, yeah. Coin, and Coinbase uh, refused quite sensibly saying that that was an unreasonable request. It was too, too much detail, of too many people. And so I think if I remember correctly, that there was eventually an agreement reached that Coinbase would provide all the details of all transactions over, I think it was 5,000 or $10,000. Yeah. Now, what people don't realize is that if the US tax authorities have now got the details of every transaction over $10,000 and the wallet owner of each of those transactions, well, they can now check that wallet for any transaction under $10,000. Now, once, yeah, once, 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 once they've got your wallet address, then they can then see every single transaction. So if they want to, they can build up a complete picture of every um, transaction that anyone who has at any point, you know, transferred more than $10,000. Yeah. This now includes everything. So you can see the way this is going. And, yeah. and, you, can, and you can see as well, that there have been recent changes with, um, in Europe in particular, with what, what's known as the Sixth Anti-Money Laundering Directive. So it's, it's called 6AMLD. And that puts in place more and more onerous requirements uh, for exchanges and organizations dealing with crypto to record and maintain details of who their customers are. So I, I don't know how long you've been into crypto, but originally you didn't need to provide any identity. You just created a wallet, you bought your crypto and, and away you went. Yeah. These days, if you're going through um, a reputable exchange, you'll have to provide your driving license or your passport. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you're not, you're not allowed to trade. Um, you have to provide additional details if you want to trade above a certain amount. And so they, they've now got details of, through all the centralized exchanges, of who everybody is. Uh, and this is why some people are going down the DeFi route of decentralized exchanges who aren't asking those questions because they're non-jurisdictional. Uh, and so it's a little bit more of a challenge for the authorities to go after them because no one really knows which country they're in. Yeah, I guess unless the authorities do what we did to Tornado Cash and say that it's illegal to use it and then say, yep. you're not allowed to use these DEXs anymore. So the, 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 That's right. And this is where I've always argued that actually in, in some ways they don't, necessarily need to regulate the exchanges when they can reg regulate the on-ramps and the off-ramps. So if you look at what happened in the UK a few years ago, and this was where you know, KYC, so Know Your Customer and AML, anti money laundering was really kicking in, that it was quite obvious uh, because the FCA sent, um, I think it's called a Dear CEO letter, and it was, it was effectively to all large financial institutions in the UK uh, to remind chief executives of their responsibilities around uh, cryptocurrency monitoring and tracking and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And so what that suddenly meant was that some of the banks just went, oh, this is too much aggro. We don't want to get involved in this. We don't want to lose our banking license. And so it became almost impossible to link your bank account to Coinbase or Crypto.com or Binance and make and make receive payments. If you can switch off the on-ramps and the off-ramps between the fiat, fiat world and the crypto world, you've practically cut off the crypto type thing. So yeah. this, this, this is where in some ways they, they don't need to go after the decentralized exchanges when all they need to do is tell the banks to refuse to deal with the decentralized exchanges. Yeah. That makes the problem go away for them in some ways. Yeah. 
But yeah, but yeah, I, I guess we'll just see how this plays out over the next few months to years to see are we going to try and introduce censorship or are we going to try to. So, so this is where it's going to be interesting on Monday, which is when the Conservative Party announce their new leader, who becomes the new pr Prime Minister of the UK. Yeah. Because, because one of the two of them has been very, very pro-crypto. Yeah. Um, and so if he wins and becomes the next PM, uh, we'll get to see whether he really meant it or not. And whether he'll start supporting um, a, a crypto-friendly regime, or whether it's all just lip service. So, yeah, well, I think well, apparently the bookie is very certain that Liz Curse is going to win it. So I think right now, if you bet a hundred pounds on Liz Trust, you'll get a hundred and one pounds back. Okay. Whereas if you bet a uh, hundred pounds on Rishi Sunak, you'll get twenty-four hundred pounds back. So, okay, yeah. Was it like usually in my experience, those are odds that the bookies are certain it's going to go that way, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll see. yeah. I, 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 I remember two of the big things happening that the bookies were certain on. Uh, one was Brexit, which, yeah. they, which they got wrong, and the other one was Trump, yeah, which, which they also got wrong. <laughs> so uh, be, be interested to see how it plays. But from a non-political perspective, um, it, it's going to be interesting because if Su if Rishi Sunak gets in, um, then he has made a number of statements about being very supportive of crypto in the UK, uh, and yeah. that could could potentially lead to some improvements if he gets in place. But yeah, who who knows? No, and, and, yeah. then, and then within the next couple of years there'll be another election anyway, and Boris will be back. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's very true. Oh, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see what happens from there. It yeah. looks like no one else is going to join us today. Y yeah, I, I'm not too sure. I guess the crypto winter is uh, getting to everyone now. I'm pretty sure once everything's booming and stuff, you'll probably have at least 10, 20 people trying to join the call. So. You, you, you're right, uh, and it's where I may need to look at. Um, running a few sessions during the week or sometimes because this time of year it gets a little bit difficult particularly on Sundays it's, yeah. it's interesting as well you're talking about the crypto winter because I've been watching <clears throat> do you watch um, Bitcoin prices and what they're doing at all uh, no I, I, I don't is, is that a YouTube channel no no just Bitcoin as oh, yeah, the, uh, the yeah, I, I do keep an eye on it because I know that the stuff I'm invested in obviously is correlated to Bitcoin yeah it's just I was kind of curious. I decided to have a quick look earlier on, and I noticed that Bitcoin at the moment, which is always a good indicator for everything else in the market, um, seems to be channeling between roughly seventeen and a half and eighteen and a half. Sorry, seventeen and a half and I think it's twenty and a half. Um, and usually when it channels. That usually means at some point there's going to be a breakout and it'll either go rapidly up or rapidly down. So I've been looking at, sorry, 19 and a half and 20 and a half. And yeah. It's been fully settled. So I'm, I'm just curious as to where it's um, going to go next. Um, yeah. I'm just keeping an eye on that to see what, what happens, really. I'll see if we've yeah. got someone else joining. I'll see if I can let them in. Bear with me as I. Well, have, they, have they gone away? They've gone away again. Someone, someone tried to join and they lost interest. <laughs> but, uh, this, this happens sometimes. Yeah. So, so I was just curious as to. Um, I, fi I find sometimes when you when you get this channeling going on, it's usually an indication that something's about to happen, either upwards or downwards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's true. Uh... So. Yeah, I guess from for myself, uh, I've always tried to stay away from technical analysis. It's uh, well, but... well, I, I I think it's excellent. I think it's excellent, but for one reason, um, and most people get um, technical analysis wrong. Technical analysis is a great way of looking at what everyone else is thinking. Yeah, it's it's, it's got nothing to do with the cryptocurrency. It's got all to do with 
um, the, the market really. And so that, that, that's where I, I, I find it of interest just to see what's going on with that. But well, maybe, maybe we'll have another view. See, we've just been joined by Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Hey, hi there. Sorry, I'm slightly late. I've just uh, only seen the um, notification on one of the uh, Telegram channels. No, no, no worries. Well, th thanks, for, thanks for joining us. You, you probably timed it really notice nicely, actually, because I just noticed that your profile says a board staking. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I run a um, kind of uh, given up the day job as such and going all in on uh, uh, running staking nodes or validator nodes uh, on delegated or proof of stake and delegated proof of stake networks. Okay. Um, I'm also a uh, community ambassador for the Radix network. All right. Okay. Um, and I'll just actually, I was just watching your video from last week. Um, and you, uh, you mentioned briefly Radix about scaling solutions and, and Radix, yep. et cetera. So yeah, I thought I might join in and, um, and uh, yeah, have a chat. Excellent. Well, it, it's something certainly I, I used to make it along to some of the uh, Radix events occasionally. Oh, brilliant. And um, I've known, is it Dan? Dan, Dan Hughes, yeah, the founder. Yeah, Dan for quite a few years now. Oh, um okay. and um i was going to say pierre it's not pierre my apologies on pierce yeah so yeah. i've known i've known pierce even longer uh, I, I knew pierce from his days when funnily enough uh, a man who's on at the moment as well uh, we were just talking about um an insurance blockchain called blockshore in fact mm -hmm. and uh, pierce used to work with blockshore years ago so yeah. I, I know the, a couple of the Radix team reasonably well. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Small world. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's um, an amazing platform, which I really look forward to it finally going properly live. Mm. Is it, it's not quite there yet, is it? Is that well, yeah. So the mainnet, uh, main, what's called Olympia mainnet, went live uh, July, end of July last year. Okay. Um, Babylon is the next major sort of a network upgrade and that's kind of a phased approach. We've got the alpha net starting this month, uh, beta net by the end of the year, and then um, the sort of Babylon main net will go live Q1 next year. Um, so we have smart contracts and scripto and everything else. Um, and that's still this uncharted um, network and then Xi'an, which is the uh, lending scalability, so unlimited scalability upgrade will happen in 2024. Okay. Um, yeah, so everything still yeah, looks largely on track for Babylon uh, for Q1 next year. Um, Scripto's just had a, um, if you know, aware of Scripto, which is the programming language or the asset asset oriented mm -hmm. language. Um, that had an update a week or so ago. Um, that's getting really good for feedback reviews and um, um, developers are starting to you know, deep, uh, you know, dive deep into the, uh, the Scripto language and come out with some amazing products and dApps and proofs of concept ready for ready for Babylon. So um, yeah, it's a really good time at the moment, exciting time. Um, the ecosystem is growing quite considerably. A lot of, you know, uh, DEXs and lots of actually some products that launched even before Babylon, they're sort of starting to gain quite a lot of traction, traction and market um, adoption. So yeah, okay. it's exciting times. And I think that that's the really good thing. It, the technology is secondary, really. It's adoption that really counts, because you you, you can have the best tech, but if no one's using it, yeah, it really doesn't work. So that, that's really good news, and great to hear they've made so much project um, progress with it. But yeah, yeah, I think you know the Radix's approach is you know they've they've done a lot of research into the developer experience, so they they see a lot of what's holding you know crypto back. Uh, is developer experience and it's very, mm -hmm. you know, there's only about 18,500 developers in Web3 at the moment uh, out of a pool of 27 million globally. So okay. you know, Web3 is, is such a, you know, it's a drop in the ocean as far as the developer pool talent. So, and, you know, the, so they've interviewed a lot of them, they've realized, and then, you know, the feedback they've had is that developer experience is, is really bad uh, with existing tools and, and networks. Um, so they're really focused on what it takes to what it would take to make the developer experience a lot more intuitive, a lot safer, a lot quicker. Um, and we've you know we've had guys who have never really developed much in their life, and they've they've they come out and they've developed DApps and won contests and everything with crypto within a matter of uh, you know a few weeks. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, it's it's that's that's the kind of where they're heading. You know, developer experience, which will then build allow developers to build you know wonderful DApps um, and happily increase adoption. Yeah. And that's, that, 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 that's really good. I mean, it, it's great that they're adopting that approach as well because this is a thing that ultimately I think made Ethereum like one of the leaders, it was the community and the developer capability that they built, built up in the community. So I think if, if Radix can build like a, a developer capability and community, that's definitely the way forward these days. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, that, I think that was, you know, one of the kind of the design decisions they made very early on with Ethereum was, you know, look at Java script based language, which uh, was obviously a lot popular, very popular at the time. Um, to help sort of bridge that developer adoption and, um, you know, without going into too much on the theory, but, it, you know, it, it, there's trade-offs with having a language that is well adopted, but, but maybe not suited for DeFi. Um, yep. So, yeah. Cool. So t tell us more about your staking. Is that something, because I, I, as you probably know, because you, you watched the video last week, it, um, I'm always happy for people to give a shout out to anything they're working on if they want to. Yes. Yeah, no problems. Yeah. So I started, um, uh, so I've been crypto since sort of 2016 on and sort of had a, you know, sort of more of a speculative side. And then I also, you know, was digging into, you know, the passive income infrastructure um, side of things and looked at all the sort of technologies and platforms that um, offer that, you know, passive income and sort of Dash came out with, you know, sort of the master node design many years ago. Um, and it kind of, you know, sort of a few years later or a year, a year or two later, sort of more proof of stake networks came out. Um, and that's when I sort of really started to dig into, you know, what networks are often proof of stake of, of um, for the, on the delegated proof of stake. So the main ones I've got are Radix and, and Avalanche. Um, and there is other sort of uh, non-delegated proof of stake networks like REN. Um, there's a Mysterium node, you know, Gnosis, um, and a couple others. So yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> there's the dashboard. So this is a this is a dashboard I've created for um, sort of the Radix ecosystem. It gives you a bit of information about the uh, the network. Um, okay. Sort of taking you know, the market data you can see there, um, and there's a if you scroll down, there's the validator dashboard, um, which uh, so Radix op uh, operates a yeah, to proof of stake with the top 100 validators uh, earning rewards or emissions. Okay. Um, you can see this little top 100 there. Um, and there are, so I think there's about 170 odd or maybe more validators, but yeah, only the top 100 actually receive uh, emissions. Okay. Um, and where it's got a search, is that like a, a standard explorer then? Yeah, so this, yeah, correct. So this is the, like an explorer for um, transactions and, and wallet addresses, et cetera. Okay. Um, and if you scroll back up again, there's a, just where the validator table is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and there's a little delegator tab. This says delegators, there's this, yeah. Click on that, it gives you um, a few calculators and uh, whatnot just to sort of calculate returns and, uh, and income in different currencies. Um, no. So yes, it's a, a little tool. Um, looking at sort of kind of developing, building on top of this over the next six to twelve months. Um, but yeah. So. Oh, look, looks good. So for anyone who's interested, that was. Um, so I, sh I should have said it as I had it open. It was avons staking.com Was that Avons? Right? Yeah, avons hyphen staking is the is the sort of main site. Um, that Radix dashboard you showed was um, yeah specific to the Radix network. So that's one. So that was a uh, radix dashboard.com. In fact, I can see on that. Cool. Okay. So sh sh shout out for anyone who's watching on the video afterwards. Then if you want to take a look at Vaughn's, it's a, a Vaughn's hyphen staking.com. Excellent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all, all, always happy to throw these things in so that, you know, um, I find quite often these little snippets are, are useful for people. Uh, who are just watching and then they go, oh, what was that staking thing? I'll just check them. And it, g it gives you a bit of publicity, no, no harm with that. That's good. Yeah, how, no, how, long, how long have you been working on all of that then? Um, so I started out sort of almost, you know, took the plunge as such and started business December 2020. 
Okay. Uh, so I've so, uh, I think you know, come up to 24 months now. Um, obviously, it's it, you know bear markets and everything. It's it's a you know it's a difficult time, but um, you know firm believer in the technology and where we're headed. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you know it, it's I think the whole idea of being able to help decentralize and secure a network. Um, support networks and and, um, yeah, and, and and income off the back of that is, is great as well. Okay. And you, you kind of hit it, I'll, I'll describe it as probably um, peak COVID as well in many places around that time. Yeah, exactly. No, it's, yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, you know, it's it's been great. It's great community. Radix community is fantastic as well. There's a lot of good and you know, very running community. Very yep. supportive. Uh, Everyone helps each other out, and the, the wider sort of Radcliffe community is, is fantastic as well. But yeah, so you know, I, I, yeah, absolutely love love what I do. Um, yeah, you know, it's a change from the corporate world, which I've done for you know twenty odd plus years, um, and the opportunity to run my own business, which is yeah, excellent. That's good. Where, where about you based then? You in the UK? Uh, London based, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think I definitely get the feeling that we're in. The blockchain and crypto world there are only two countries which is uk and the rest of the world well, that's the way it feels at times but that's the, the nature of london i guess hmm. uh, but but there are actually many, many before anyone criticizes me afterwards yes i know there are actually lots of other um places that are hugely active in crypto and certainly um i get involved in some of the stuff in the west coast of the states and in Singapore and Australia and Switzerland, so there are actually uh, lots of other things going on. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the globally, the, the adoption is, is growing steadily. It's um, lots of the, we call it, I guess, non traditional markets where it's really growing, like Vietnam is, is massive for crypto. I think it's. Yeah, I've, I've noticed as well, particularly th things like gaming, um, the Far East is very hot on that. So Vietnam and South Korea. Yeah. Um, I keep an eye on Samsung, who you know, the, one of the world's largest um, electronics manufacturers, but they're getting into things like um, less so NFTs now. Although they did do some NFTs, but the whole metaverse space, which mm -hmm. will inevitably overlap into crypto and that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's, it definitely uh, the other uh, corporates. Uh... Globally, you know, like all the, there's the, so I think it was Microsoft and Nvidia, uh, Meta, quite a few sort of large, you know, very big corporates have joined forces as such as trying to define some um, Web3 or Metaverse standards, um, which is going to be very interesting to see how that plays out uh, yep. uh, compared to sort of the open source, you know, approach to crypto as it is now. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be uh, globally, you know, as you say, a lot of these companies are, um, uh, have got a, a massive presence in, in Asian markets. I think what we read today as well, Binance are investing heavily in Nigeria for block, blockchain sort of development and uh, educational technology. Uh, some of the, you know, the sort of non-traditional non areas are starting to gain a lot of uh, adoption and, and investment. Uh, okay. Well, it, it's good, and it, it does wake you up to the fact that there is um, a lot of capabilities elsewhere in the world these days. Mm. And, and ultimately, you know, if, if you're learning you know, Web3 or whatever, it's all relatively new pretty much to everybody. You know, there's not a lot of people who've got like loads of experience because it's a relatively new concept. But there must be plenty of Web2 developers these days who are looking to make that leap to... Like de decentralized um, systems and that. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, yeah, I think they are. I think it's also it's, there's a lot of stigma, I guess, as well with crypto. And you know, there's unfortunately there's a lot of you know hacks and scams and things that happen. And um, I do, you know, in certain sort of developer communities, Web three and crypto is is a, is a dirty word mm. because of the sort of scams and everything that happen. Um, so, so do you th <laughs> I was, I was going to say, do you think there's an opportunity then with Jack Dorsey talking about Web five <laughs> that that we kind of gently ease away from Web three being crypto and blockchain and Web five being 
Yeah, I'm not sure what Web5 is, to be honest. I think yeah. whether it's just his own branding or uh, he, he's got, uh, I don't know how you get from Web3 to Web5 personally, but yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, obviously he wants to, he would like it, just like most entrepreneurs, like to shape an industry around their own thoughts and, and, and ideas. Um, so I think, you know, maybe that's Jack's own interpretation. Yeah. I, I I agree. I I get the feeling almost it was kind of like he's he's invented it as like a brand image type thing, mm. and and now he's going to have to go away and work out where it actually is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's mm. sometimes the way that entrepreneurs work. I guess that they 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 create a demand for something we didn't know we wanted, yeah. um, and then build build the capability well, from it, that. Yeah, the best way to invent the future is to create it. You know. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Certainly on there. So, any new, other news or anything, Andrew? Anything that you're watching at the moment we could share? No, just um, yeah, just to say, I, I saw um, your invite pop up on one of the uh, Telegram channels, so I'd, I'd jump in and say good day. Um, right. That I did, and um, <laughs> yeah, and I've got your. I think it's, this is a weekly thing, is it? On Sunday nights. It, it, it is. Uh, it's currently every Sunday, seven pm UK. Currently BST. Um, you probably go to GMT when that changes at the end of October. So yeah, it's, it's on every week. It's open to everybody, novice and expert alike. So if you want to come along and share some more insights, that, that's fantastic. We yeah. sometimes get novices who are just learning about this stuff, who ask some wonderfully simple questions, which I, I love helping them to answer um, because I think it actually helps you learn more about the technology if you can actually explain it. Um, so yeah, the Open every week, open open to everybody. Brilliant. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, you'll be able to join on a, a more regular basis. F fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll close the call off for today then as we're get, getting pretty close to one the hour anyway. Um, thanks for coming along, Andrew. Much appreciated. And do, do come back again. Definitely. And uh, I'd love to hear more about what Radix is up to as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll um, maybe I'll, I'll put some links in the chat with some recent sort of updates and. Um, podcasts and news, etc. that might find interesting. Okay, cool. Excellent. Th thanks for that. Yeah. All right, and Andrew, have a great day and we'll speak again. Cheers, Gary. Thank you. Che cheers. Bye for now. So thanks everyone for joining us today. I hope you found that of interest. Do come and join us. As I said earlier on, we meet every Sunday evening, 7pm UK BST. Check for the link down below on how to join a future session. Do remember, if you enjoyed this, do click on the subscribe, click on like, make comments. Um, everything that, that helps help promote it, always appreciated.